Good afternoon. Welcome to the October 21st formal meeting of the Phoenix City Council. I will now call the meeting to order and we will begin with roll call. Councilman DeCicio. Here. Councilmember Garcia. Councilmember Garcia. Councilman Nowakowski. Here. Councilwoman Pastor. Councilwoman Stark. Here. Councilman Waring. Here. Councilwoman Williams. Here. Vice Mayor Guardado. Here. Mayor Gallego. Here. Mario Barajas is with us today to provide support for residents who speak Spanish. Mario, would you introduce yourself? Sure, Mayor, thank you. My name is Mario Barajas. I'm gonna be providing interpretation for the Spanish speakers today. I'm gonna to be introducing myself now to the Spanish speakers. Uh, buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Mario Barajas. Yo voy a estar sirviendo como su intérprete de español el día de hoy. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much, Mayor. Thank you, Mario. Thanks for your support. Will the city clerk please read the 24 hour paragraph? The titles of the following ordinance and resolution numbers on the agenda were available to the public at least 24 hours prior to this council meeting and therefore may be read by title or agenda item only. Ordinances number G6749 through 6756, S46990 through 47029, and resolutions 21870 through 21875. Thank you. Councilwoman Stark. Have you had a chance to review the meeting minutes from October 16th, 2019? Yes, Mayor, I have. And I recommend approval of the minutes for October 16th, 2019. Second. Second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, the minutes pass unanimously. We next move to boards and commissions. Vice Mayor, do we have a motion? Yes, Mayor. Motion to approve Mayor and City Council boards and commissions nominations except for Rocco Cook, Rebecca Lutz, appointment to the Fast Track Cities Ad Hoc Committee. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Passes unanimously. Do we have a second motion, Vice Mayor? Yes, we do. Motion to approve Rocco Cook and Rebecca Lutz appointment to the Fast Track Cities Ad Hoc Committee, noting Councilwoman Stark's possible conflict. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 And I abstain. So, uh, this is 8 0 no noting that Councilwoman Stark did not participate. We next move to the liquor license portion of our agenda. Mayor, just real Mayor, quick, and I missed, I missed the roll call. This is Councilmember Garcia. Just want to note I'm here. Uh, thank you, Council Councilman Garcia. Pass doors on to the birthday girl. Yes, Council Councilwoman Pastor will be celebrating this weekend. Happy Elmo's birthday. <laughs> uh, Vice Mayor, do we have a motion on liquor licenses? Yes, we have a motion to approve items 13 through 82, except the following. Items 37, 38. No, no, the liquor license first. Right? Uh, oh, I am so sorry. Yeah. That is true. Motion Three to through approve 10, items. Perhaps? Sorry, sorry. <laughs> I'm trying to get ahead of myself here. Motion to approve items 3 to 12, except items 11 and 12. Second. Any discussion? No. Those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? 
passes unanimously. Some some fun uh, places to eat. Now, item number eleven is a quick stop in Westchester District. Councilwoman, I will turn to you to introduce the item and for a motion. Um, I do have staff. Um, Staff rec recommends disapproval of item 11 based on no uh, neighborhood protest. Uh, the state ultimately decides whether to approve or disapprove the liquor license. However, based on the neighborhood objections, I move to recommend disapproval of this application. Second. Mayor. Thank you, Councilwoman Pastor. Do we? Uh, I do not see any members of the public here to testify. Mayor. Do we have any council member questions? Mayor, just a quick question. This is for the. This Please, is for a quick trip, you. correct? Oh, it's for a quick trip, correct? Quick stop. Oh, quick stop. Oh, okay, I read, misread it. Okay, thank you, Mayor. Okay. Um, any further questions? All right, we will uh, roll call on Councilwoman Pastor's motion of disapproval. Decisio. Yes. Garcia. Yes. Nowakowski. Yes. Pastor. Yes. Stark. Yes. Waring. Yes. Williams. Yes. Guardado. Yes. Gallego. Yes. Passes 9-0. Item 12 is a Yogi's Mark in Councilwoman Stark's district. I will turn to Councilwoman Stark to introduce the item and for a motion. Thank you, uh, Mayor. So staff recommends disapproval of item 12 based on the police department's recommendation for disapproval. Therefore, I will recommend disapproval of item 12. Second. Second. Motion and a second. Do we have any council member counter questions? All right, seeing on roll call on Councilwoman Stark's motion to disapprove. Uh, see roll call on Councilwoman Stark's. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Decisio? Yes. Garcia? Yes. Nowakowski? Yes. Pastor? Yes. Stark? Yes. Waring? Yes. I apologize. Waring? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you now. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Williams? Yes. Guardado? Yes. Gallego? Yes. Passes 9-0. Next, we move to ordinances, resolutions, new business planning and zoning. City clerk, are we ready? Yes, Mayor. Um, and we had originally looked at doing a motion to take uh, two items out of order. Um, Councilwoman Pastor, we would like to just move forward with item 57. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. Um, there's some technical difficulties happening right now and just found out um, that's why I was delayed. Uh, at 130, our system crashed. And so we can't get, people are having difficulties. So, um, if item 56, if that could be uh, continued, that would be great. And if we could move uh, along with 57 with Louisa Stark. Wonderful. Then I will turn to Vice Mayor for a motion to suspend the rules. Yes, Mayor. I make a motion to suspend the rules to take item 57 out of order. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? 
we next move then to item 57, which is the Dr. Louisa Stark ceremonial street sign topper. I will turn to Councilwoman Castor to introduce the item. Uh, I am excited to introduce this item because I've uh, known Louisa Stark for a very long time, but most importantly, her, it's her work that she has left in the Garfield area. Um, she has done uh, many, many of her friends contacted me and asked if this, we could uh, put a uh, sign topper in the Garfield area of where she was. And I said, I would advocate and push for that. Um, I'm going to read something, but I, my other phone's going to is ringing. So there is going to be some noise. Uh, Dr. Louisa Stark is a graduate of Bernard College, Columbia University and New York University, where she earned a PhD in linguistics and anthropology. She came to Phoenix in 1981 to work with the Heard Museum. She quickly became interested and involved in Phoenix's emerging, emerging homeless issue. Uh, she created organizations to assist with that issue and became local, state, and a national leader, including the president of the National Coalition for the Homeless. Um, many Phoenix neighborhoods and historic buildings are still with us because of her intensive advocacy for their preservation. She did this not only to preserve the beauty and the texture of our town's past, but to provide the mix of buildings, homes necessary at the city is to be a community of people of different incomes and backgrounds. She has always been guided by her expertise and her sensitivity as an anthropologist. In fact, her accreditations in that field go beyond her degrees. Her nine years in Ecuador, Bolivia, Paraguay, for example, produced groundbreaking and important work, especially for the education of the indigenous people of the region. In the 1980s, she founded the Phoenix Community Housing Partnership, a nonprofit to develop affordable housing options for low-income families. The majority of the agency housing was located within Garfield, another downtown neighborhoods, although the work extended to Sunny Slope and the East Valley. That work continues, though she is now retired and pursuing scholarly, scholarly projects during many years of the partnership operations, she served for no salary. Over 10,000 Phoenix families have been directly served by her work, meaning they found a roof over their heads when no other answers to their prayers were forthcoming, and we all owe her our respects and our thanks. And then I have a statement below from Dr. Fred Harness, who couldn't speak today. Mayor, Count, Mayor or Council Members, friends of Louisa Stark, thank you for the well-deserved honor you are bestowing on Louisa today. I'm incredi incredibly pleased to see that Louisa is being recognized for her decades of work, meeting the needs of literally thousands of men, women, and children in the city and beyond. I'm sure you will hear about her work beginning in the early 1980s, leading the first advocacy efforts on behalf of the Phoenix homeless population through the Consortium for Homeless and her decades of work as an executive director of Community Housing Partnership, which we co-founded in 1987. We, you will hear about deep, her deep commitment to Garfield neighborhood and her many years of service on the school board. But what many don't know about or have forgotten is Louisa's impact on the nation's response to homelessness. In her 1983 anthropological study of homelessness in Phoenix was one of the first deep looks into modern homelessness and informed national policy. She was the first president of the board of the DC based National Coalition for Homelessness which at the time was the largest and most influential homeless advocacy group in the nation. And her writings and journals and regular interviews in the media were key to raising the issue nationwide. Louisa is the most certainly a gift to Phoenix, but she's also a gift to this nation. And to be honest, she's a gift to me. My chance, my chance meeting with her at the Consortium for the Homelessness, homelessness gathering dramatically changed the trajectory of my life's work, and I have cherished her friendship and mentoring for nearly four decades. Thank you, Louisa, and thank you to the council for recognizing this incredible woman. Thank you. 
Thank you, Councilwoman. Thank you for your leadership in this area and wonderful words from someone who has done so much for housing and homelessness as well. I had the pleasure of first meeting Dr. Stark when I served on the site committee at Augusta Shaw Elementary, and she was a school board leader in the district and had a real passion for all of our young people. And then I got to serve alongside her on the Central City Village, where she led on a variety of other issues, including historic preservation. So certainly an accomplished community leader. Uh, Congressman Stanton shares that Louisa taught us to be more empathetic and compassionate in policymaking especially concerning Venetians experiencing homelessness and that she is a legend of Phoenix. Congressman Gallego shares that Phoenix is a better place because of Dr. Stark. And we have many others who, who have gotten alongside her and, and are glad to see um, this moving forward. So thank you, Dr. Stark, for what you have done. Council member comments. Seeing none, we will go to the phone to Dennis Burke. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I want to use my minute to tell you uh, Louisa's story. Um, I was on her board for 20 years, but this goes back to just before she started Community Housing Partnership. I got a call one evening from Louisa asking me to drive with her down into the river bottom uh, to a homeless encampment. It was a cold night, uh, but there was a fire and a 55-gallon drum, and there were Families gathered around it, men, women, and children. Uh, they had been chased from one awful place to another. This one happened to be next to a pig farm, which was even awfuler. But they had been told that the sheriffs were going to arrive in the morning with helicopters to uh, arrest them, and, um, and they would take their children. Um, so we were there because Louisa had got word uh, th that some of the men in the group had guns, and they figured they were had nowhere else to go, and they wanted to make a last stand and a statement. Um, and they, they had called Louisa to arrange getting their children out of there. So Louisa talked to them all as they were gathered around the fire. There was a minister among them. Um, and in fact, it was the man who had called her for help. After talking privately with the minister for a minute, she addressed the group. She said that, yes, she understood that they wanted to make a last stand and let them be heard and not be invisible, but they could let the minister do that for them. He would stay and be arrested and speak on their behalf in the morning. The rest of them would please follow her, Louisa, to a new place. They discussed it, and there was some heat to the discussion because they were tired of moving around. But they packed up their belongings, and they walked through the night to the east to a little Phoenix City Park that I think only Louisa knew existed. It was surrounded on all sides by industrial uses and vacant lands. There were no neighborhoods anywhere nearby. Uh, so she had moved this political hot potato from the county's uh, um, a purview to the cities. And uh, by midday, there was a line of Phoenix police officers strung across the parking lot of that little park, ready to clear it out. I slipped through the line with a bag of supplies that Louisa had sent me out to borrow from my own children. And we quickly passed out from that, from that uh, big bag of supplies, uh, basketballs, soccer balls, frisbees, and other equipment that my kids let us borrow. And the, the park was soon a model of athletic activity. The police sergeant got on the phone to the city attorney who advised him to stand down. You can't arrest people for playing ball in a park, was the decision of the legal department. The sergeant laughed when he told me that and seemed delighted that the situation had been diffused. What Louisa was doing, is, is that my two minutes? I can't be deep. I'm a key man, unless, yeah, you may push uh, the Senate. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Anyway, before the police could, could come back, uh, it, it was on TV. And when it was on TV, a guy who owned an apartment building nearby that was very dilapidated said, if these people want to help fix it up, they can live in it for a time. They, in fact, formed a community, and they lived in it for nearly two years. What, what, what Louisa was doing was buying time for them, and that's what she did with her housing everywhere, because people need a little time and a little grace to get back on their feet to figure out what they're going to do with their lives. And that story, to me, sticks in mind because... Uh, it was so real. It was so cold that night. And it was just one of th literally thousands and thousands of acts of courage that she did for the people of Phoenix. Thanks. Thank you. Any council member comments? Council member no. Garcia. No. Thank you. Um, I just want to echo what folks have said. I think it's an opportune time to recognize someone like Louisa for the work that she's done throughout the years and, and her empathy and, and 
and the way she brought humanity to to folks without shelter. And so on, I echo a lot of what's been said and proud that her name will be displayed in District 8 in the Garfield neighborhood. And thank you, Councilwoman Pastor, for your work to make this happen. Thank you. Councilwoman Pastor, would you make a motion, please? I move to uh, move item 57. And I'm trying to look on my notes. Uh, Perfect. <laughs> for the Dr. Louisa Starks Ceremonial Street sign topper. Second. Roll call. Tasisio. Yes. Garcia. Yes. Nowakowski. Yes. Pastor. Yes. Stark. Yes. Waring. Yes. Williams. Yes, she's very deserving. Guardado. Yes. Gallego. Yes. Passes 9 0. Congratulations to Dr. Stark. Well deserved. Vice Mayor, do you have an omnibus motion now? Yes, I have a motion to approve items 13 through 82, except the following items 37, 38, 42, 48, 49, 50, 52, 53, 56, 79, 80, and 81. Item 42 is as corrected. Item 46 has been withdrawn. Item 56 has been continued to November 4th and excluding these items for public comment 33, 57, 81, and 82. Nice job. Do we have a second? Second. Roll call. Mayor, just one quick uh, oh. correction on item 72. It says Libra Lane. It should be Air Libra Lane. They left off the air. I think it's still okay and acceptable to approve it. I just so then we sure. would move item two as correct. Is that? Yeah, if we could. It's, it's probably a minor detail. Thank but you for catching that. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Thank you. Wonderful, Vice Vice Mayor. Would you be comfortable with moving item seventy two with the corrected name? Yes. And city staff, are we comfortable with that? Yes, Mayor. All right, so we have a motion and a second. Roll call. DeCicio? Yes. Garcia? Yes. Nowakowski? Yes. Pastor? Yes. Stark? Yes. Waring? Yes. Williams? Yes. Guardado? Yes. Gallego? Yes. Passes 9 0. We next move to item 33, which is the authorization to amend the ordinance to reflect authorized annual increases for our contract with Community Bridges, who helps us provide services. Vice Mayor, do we have a motion? Motion to approve item 33. Second. Do we have a second? Second. <laughs> Thank you, Councilwoman Stark. And I should have said Community Bridges helps us provide services, including to those experiencing homelessness. Uh, we do have public comment on this item, so we will turn to Elizabeth Venable. I wanted to say it's sort of ironic that we're honoring um, Dr. Stark, who was helping campers, and then we have community bridges with words of the police to enforce restrictions as well as helping campers. I don't necessarily know it's, it would be her vision for the city of Phoenix. Uh, I'm glad to see more funding then for community bridges, but. Um, I think that you need to look at why these programs don't have a very high success rate. 
Um, there was an extra thing in the New Times a couple of years ago, which said that they don't perform very well. It takes about like 20 to 30 contacts with an individual to get them to engage. I don't, th I think they're too restricted, but they have been in the past. They required, at least in the past, that you comply with the behavioral health program. And I don't even know if that is constitutional or uh, legal to require someone to participate in a behavioral health program for a city service to receive houselessness services. So I would hope you would make sure that their contract is less restrictive in terms of who they can help. And I would hope that at some point you could decouple them from the police so that they could do their good work separate from law enforcement, which isn't supposed to be happening. Thank you. Thank you. Elizabeth, is Alicia with you? She doesn't, she doesn't want to speak. Thank you. Oh, you we have a motion and a second. Any council member comments? Roll call. DeCicio. Yes. Garcia. Yes. Nowakowski. Yes. Pastor. Uh, yes. Stark. Yes. Waring. Yes. Williams. Yes. Guardado. Yes. Gallego. Yes. Passes 9 0. Thank you. Item 37 and 38 are related items. So if council members are comfortable, we will take them together. 37 is the downtown enhanced municipal services estimate of expenses and to set the public hearing. And 32 is the district assess, or 38 is the district assessment diagram. Vice Mayor, do we have a motion? Yes, we have a motion to approve items 37 and 38. Second. Council member comments. Roll call. Cecilio. No. Garcia. Yes. Nowakowski. Yes. Castor. Yes. Stark. Yes. Waring. No. Williams. Yes. Guardado? Yes. Gallego? Yes. Passes 7 2. Items 48, 49, and 50 are all related to our light rail system. So if council members are comfortable, we will hear those together as well. Uh, Vice Mayor, do we have a motion on 48, 49, and 50? Yes, we Mayor. have a motion. Mayor, did we do 42 already? Did we take it off the agenda? I don't think uh, we, we did not. Again. Mayor, I heard the, uh, this is the clerk. I heard the vice mayor read that item 42 was as corrected. And there may be a conflict as well. So we do need to pull that. We, we I'm did sorry, the that. memo I had did not have 42. Okay. Sorry, I had an outdated, I think, draft. Uh, Vice Mayor, do you have a motion on 42? Yes, we have a motion to approve item 42 as corrected. Second. Second. All right, um, any comments noting that Councilwoman Pestor will not be participating? Mayor. Roll call. Oh, yeah, roll call. Oh, Mayor. Oh. Councilman DeCicio. Okay. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, Wonderful. Councilman DeCicio, you, you did not wish to comment. You wish to vote yes. Is that right? Well, 42. Yeah, I was going to make a comment, but it, you know, I'm, I'm good with this. I appreciate it. I appreciate all the things that the police officers do in our community. And this is something that the district really wanted. And I've had heartburn about this in the past, just because the way our police officers are treated in these schools. But in this district here, the police are really well loved and the district really wants them. 
the public wants them and um, you know I appreciate all the work that officers do for our, for our schools thank you mayor Roll call. Cecilio. Yes. Garcia. Yes. Nowakowski. Yes. Pastor. Oh, I, I'm sorry. I apologize. Stark. Yes. Waring. Yes. Williams. Yes. Guardado. Yes. Gallego. Yes. Passes eight zero. Yes. Okay. Items 48, 49, and 50 again are related to light rail, so we will hear them together, but public testimony separate on each item. Do we have a motion on the 48, 49, and 50? Move yes, approval. Mayor. Motion to approve 48, 49, and 50. Second. Wonderful. Uh, we do have one member of the public here to address the council. Uh, we will, uh, Walter Gray, we will begin with his comments on the application to submit Federal Transit Administration grant. Yes, uh, Mayor, I'd like to comment on item number 48. I also have comments on item number 49 and 50, if you want to take those separately. But on, on 48, that's the uh, Northwest Light Rail to Metro Center. Um, I, I hope the city will make known the plans for Metro Center. Um, I think that uh, it's a great opportunity to make Metro Center and the surrounding area an employment hub and an education hub so that the two can be combined to upgrade the people in that area without justification. Um, so I, that's my main comment uh, for Metro Center. Uh, I don't know if you have any information on what the future plans for Metro Center are. Uh, that would be very good. But I encourage you to emphasize employment, uh, regular, not retail or service employment, but advanced manufacturing, health care, those types of employment uh, that are dominant in our uh, area and that uh, would actually do a better job of uh, reinvigorating North Phoenix without gentrification. Thank you. Thank you. And on the South Central Extension Downtown Hub Light Rail Grant Agreement. Again, uh, we need an employment hub and an education hub, probably in uh, Phoenix South, South Phoenix South, uh, so that in the upper part of South Phoenix, where there's uh, some vacant land and some existing industrial and commercial uses that uh, we need an education and industrial and employment there so to, to do the same thing that i said we should do at metro center combine good employment advanced manufacturing health um uh, solar, those kinds of things uh and train the people to do those jobs and and uh, revitalize South Phoenix without uh, gentrification. Um, that's my comment there. One thing we do have an additional comment on the extension transfer development grant. Uh, yes, yes, I do. Uh, uh, and I think this is a really the main thing I 
I want to say is that I really hope that the city, um, you know, I think the appointment of the TOD committee is done by the council and the mayor, but I really hope that this is, you know, whatever the legal process is, that this, that the community be involved in recommending committee members for the TOD and the chair. I, we had co-chairs in South Phoenix. We may have, well have co-chairs in Northwest Phoenix. So I, I think it's important to vet the, the committee members and the chairs through the, the uh, have the uh, village planning committee in that area hold the public meeting, a, a well-publicized, good venue meeting so that the colleges in that area, the community uh, leaders, uh, the churches, and um, and people of that, and that nature can participate and recommend uh, people for uh, the TOD, particularly working poor and poor people. They have the best objectivity and logical thinking, and that I've ever witnessed, and I've. I've had a. I've been involved in all of this stuff for 60 years, and I've never seen anybody as logical and as uh, objective as the inner city. Thank you all. Thank you for your long time involvement. Council member comments. Roll call. Decisio. Yes. Garcia. Yes. Nowakowski. Yes. Pastor. Yes. Stark. Yes. Waring. No. Williams. Yes. Guardado. Yes. Gallego. Yes. Passes 8-1. We next move to items 52 and 53, which are related items on our security access and control project. So we will take those two together. Vice Mayor, do we have a motion on 52 and 53? Motion to approve items 52 and 53. Second. Second. Motion in a second. Council member comments or questions. Oh, Mayor. Councilman DeCicio. Yeah, I made an error on that last item. That was a no for me. Um, on this one here, uh, I normally vote against these type of things because you're using bonding money for basically short term projects. I'd be like, you know, using a house mortgage to buy a sofa. You don't do those things. So, but I'm going to be voting for this, Mayor. It's a security related issue, something we need to do. But I would hope in the future we just look at capital, be used for long term types of bonding. Thank you, Mayor. But I made an error on the last one. Council Member DeCicio, just to clarify for the record, are you voting yes or no on 48, 49, and 50? I was voting no on that. Okay, we will note that for the record with a technical correction. Thank you. Yes, yeah, thank you for that. And Mayor Councilman DeCicio, just uh, to assure you, the Chief Financial Officer is only uh, issuing debt for the security and access control system for the life of the system. It is not like taking a 30-year mortgage for a sofa. It is actually she's matching the debt service to the expected life of the system. And I appreciate that, Ed, I, I do. And I knew that that's what they were doing, but still okay. these are not capital related type of projects. And, you know, I do appreciate that she's trying to match that. But at the same time, you know, capital should be used for capital. Otherwise we just go down that slippery slope and you know, I'm happy to vote for this one. I do, I do believe we need the security system in place. But I do get concerned about the financing method. Thank Understood. You. Understood. Thank you, Councilman. Thank you. Roll call on 52 and 53. 
Decisio. Yes. Garcia. Yes. Nowakowski. Yes. Pastor. Yes. Stark. Yes. Waring. No. Williams. Williams. Yes. Thank you. Guardado. Yes. Gallego. Yes. Passes 8 1. Thank you. We next move to item 79, general plan amendment. We'll begin with a brief staff report. Mayor, we have the planning director coming forward at this time. Thank you. We welcome planning development director Alan Stevenson. Thank you, Mayor, members of council. I will uh, be brief on these two items uh, and then. Uh, we can hear them both together, 79 and 80, and then separate motions uh, for them. Uh, in this particular instance, item 79 is a general plan amendment for the northwest corner of Interstate 17 and Loop 303 freeway. Item 80 is a corresponding zoning case for the same parcel. Here uh, on the slide, you see the, the aerial map of it. Carefree Highway is on the north, shown as State Route 74. Dead Man's Wash on the west, the Loop 303 on the south, and I-17 on the east. It's approximately 3,700 acres of land that is owned by the Arizona State Land Department, held in trust for the benefit of education and other uh, interests within the state. The existing general plan uh, designation is various residential and mixed use uh, uses, uh, and then the request is to go to a mixed use commercial commerce park and remove the infrastructure phasing overlay to allow this area to develop as an employment uh, corridor. The Village Planning Committee did recommend approval uh, five to zero of the general plan amendment request, and then the Planning Commission also recommended approval unanimously per the North Gateway Village Planning Committee recommendation. This just shows the colored uh, land use designations of what it was on the general plan and what it's going to here with uh, Commerce Park uh, in, red, in gray and then the red in commercial. The corresponding zoning case is from S1 to PUD. The PUD is for a planned unit development to uh, allow for that employment corridor to develop uh, over a long time period. In this case, staff does recommend approval per the Planning Commission recommendation. The Village Planning Committee recommended uh, approval as well as the Planning Commission uh, with uh, a six to zero vote and some additional stipulations uh, to address some uh, issues between the applicant and staff that were worked out on it. So here's the zoning map for it. Uh, you can see it's all uh, S1 today, and then uh, on the east side of I-17 corridor, you do have the North Gateway Village core, as well as uh, residential further off. To the north, you have the Ben Avery and Arizona Game and Fish uh, facility, and then to the south is uh, vacant land also owned by the State Land Department, as well as to the west. The land use plan has a freeway mixed use component uh, within that corridor from I-17 freeway over to 43rd, and then Technology Park and Technology uh, Campus, uh, as shown on this uh, land use plan. And there are correlating um, uses and standards within each of these areas as part of the planned unit development. Uh, you can see these are the sub areas that are broken out within there where we have those uh, designations and uses listed out. Uh, staff does recommend approval per the Planning Commission recommendation and adoption of the related resolution for item 79 and item 80. It's recommend approval of the uh, ordinance um, from the Planning Commission recommendation. And with that, we're happy to answer any questions. Wonderful, thank you. I will open the public hearing. We do not have any members of the public to address the council, so I will close the public hearing. Want to thank everyone involved in this. Phoenix is moving forward with creating high wage jobs, and part of that is great land use planning. So, thank you to all who worked on this. Uh, we will take a motion. Oh, council member comments? Mayor? Councilwoman. Councilwoman Williams represents the area. This is a 
an area that we have been working on for a long time and it has exceeded our expectations. I will mention for those who are worried about Ben Avery, they are in agreement with this, uh, fully su supportive. If I can, I'd make the motion to approve for the planning commissions and adopt the related resolution on 79. I will second that. Roll call. That's one of them. Cecio? Yes. Garcia? Yes. Nowakowski? Yes. Pastor? Yes. Stark? Yes. Waring? Yes. Williams? Yes. Guardado? Yes. Gallego? Yes. Yes, Larry. That's his Larry. <laughs> Item 80 is a related case with the rezoning application. Councilwoman Williams, do you have a motion? I do. I believe very strongly in this. So I make the motion to approve for the planning commission and adopt the related ordinance. Second. Roll call. Decisio. Decisio. Garcia. Yes. Nowakowski. Yes. Pastor. Yes. Stark. Yes. Waring. Yes. Woo. Williams. Yes. Guardado. Yes. Gallego. Yes. Passes 8 0. We next move to item 81, which is a case at the southeast corner of 107th Avenue and Camelback Road in the vice mayor's district. We will begin with a staff report from our planning and development director. Thank you, mayor, members of council. Item 80 is a uh, rezoning request to uh, golf course zoning for a parcel that is currently zoned R16, uh, R16 uh, special permit in C2 for a 122.92 acre parcel. Uh, this use would be for allowing uh, redevelopment of a golf course property. Uh, this staff does recommend approval subject to stipulations. Uh, the area shown in yellow is the uh, former Via De Paz golf course, uh, and that is the subject site of the proposed rezoning uh, application. Uh, this request uh, did come in uh, for this golf course, was developed in uh, Maricopa County uh, and zoned in Maricopa County and then annexed into the city later on in three different annexation areas. And so uh, you see this map just shows the different annexation areas and there's a northwest uh, in yellow, the central annexation in gray, and then the southeast annexation area in blue here. The uh, central area in gray, when that was annexed, there was a stipulation placed on that that requires uh, the golf course to be in general conformance to the Via de Paz plan of development that was stipulated at the time of the rezoning in the county. And so that requires that the uh, golf course be uh, the land not be used for anything other than a golf course or left uh, vacant um, unless a stipulation modification is granted through the planning hearing officer process and ultimately by the mayor and city council. The northwest area as well as the southeast area do not have that stipulation on them and those areas could proceed uh, you know, with, with development under the existing R16 zoning. This is because in Maricopa County, uh, a golf course is uh, permitted as a R16 zoning use within them. However, in the city of Phoenix, uh, they are not, but because there weren't stipulations on those parcels when they were annexed in the 80s, those ones could go forward uh, and develop. The uh, proposed uh, request is as shown here to rezone all of that area to GC for golf course. Uh, the Village Planning Committee does recommend approval for the staff recommendation. Uh, the Planning Commission recommended uh, approval for the Maryville Village uh, Planning Committee recommendation. They also had some comments on the allowed uses within the golf course district. 
staff does uh, recommend approval pursuant to the Planning Commission uh, recommendation, but only as it relates to the change of zoning from the R16 and other categories to the GC district, uh, subject to stipulations. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Do any council members have questions for our planning director? We uh, will then open the public hearing. We will hear uh, presentations from two different perspectives, uh, 10 minutes each, and then we will go to public, to uh, public comment. We have many individuals ready to address the council. Uh, we will begin with Larry Lazarus. Can you hear me? We can. Thank you. <clears throat> Uh, for the record, my name is Larry Lazarus. Uh, my office is at 206 East Virginia, uh, and I represent Virtue Partners, the owners of the property under consideration. Uh, Jeremy Hall, I believe, is on the line. Uh, Albert Nava, who is going to take two minutes uh, under general uh, discussion, uh, who is a nationally recognized expert in golf course and residential appraisals. Uh, this is not a typical zoning case where a property owner is coming to you and asking permission to rezone their property. This is government coming in over the objection of the property owner, demanding to rezone the owner's property and take away their ability to develop their property according to the rights that they have today. The city is proposing that government can take away property rights, and now the city is going to make a decision on their own proposal. We believe that's bad public policy. I would ask that you, how you would feel if your neighbor attempted to require you to operate a business at a loss because they believed it would benefit them. Then furthermore, the neighbors pressure their government representative to force you to run that business or as an alternative, if you refuse, take away those rights that you have to use the property. The neighbors and the government have no financial interest in your business. So they have nothing to lose by taking those rights away. That's not the way government should operate in this country, nor in this community. This property owner brought the, bought this property in 2017. They did not buy the property with the idea that they had to rezone the property to residential development. They do, did their due diligence. The majority of the property was zoned R16, allowing residential development. There was no limitation requiring the golf course use under a special permit if the golf course was abandoned for 12 months, leaving the residential zoning, which it was. A portion of the golf course, including the driving range and pro pro shop, had already been approved by the city for redevelopment as a multifamily apartment project. There were no covenants, conditions, or restrictions restricting the property to be used only as a golf course. There was no existing plan of development subject to a stipulation on any portion of the golf course, uh, as opposed to what uh, you heard from Mr. Stevenson. It was not a, there was a stipulation, but it was not a stipulation based upon the general Villa de Paz plan. It was a specific stipulation that it would comply with the Villa de Paz neighborhood unit plan of development dated 5-12-73. That was the stipulation. That plan does not exist. We have searched through the county records. We have searched through the city records. The city has searched for it. That plan is, does not exist. How can you comply with a plan that you cannot find? Additionally, a court case was filed with the neighbors claiming there was implied restriction or detrimental reliance that the land would remain a golf course. That case was dismissed by the court. As a matter of fact, a good portion of this land has already been processed by the city of Phoenix and a final plat has been submitted and almost ready for approval. You're gonna hear from some individuals that the golf course is viable and can be sold to someone who could operate it. Nothing could be further from the truth. Before the golf course was closed, it was losing $300,000 a year. In 1914, it was used, losing $94,500 a year. In, 19, in, to, in 2015, it was losing $169,000 a year. 
This course was spiraling downward. And as a matter of fact, right before they bought the property in 2016, it was losing $300,000 a year. They had to close the golf course, and that's why there's no golf course here today. It was not done in order to spite the neighbors or upset the neighbors. It became, became a continued business. The owner knew that the property could be developed for residential, and obviously the city knows that as well. Otherwise, there would be no reason for the city to come here today and request to downzone the property and take those rights away. The owners of the property and prior owners have been interacting with the community representatives for years. And the only resolution those representatives stated that they would accept was to save the golf course, one that does not exist. That was the only resolution. Mr. O'Toole, who will speak to you in a soon, has now convinced councilmen from this District 5 to proceed to take away those rights. Although they do not own the property, they believe that they will benefit from forcing that property owner to run a golf course, even at a loss. Mr. O'Toole boasted that he had purchasers that would buy the property and run it as a golf course. And actually, in an effort to investigate that possibility, the owner met with two of those people. Both of them decided after reviewing the financials that they could not buy this golf course, not because the purchase price was too high, but because even if they paid nothing for the land, the golf course would continue to lose money. They all walked away because the only reasonable use is R16, and that's why the owner strongly opposes this zoning case. We've submitted an appraisal to you from a nationally renowned appraiser who is here today, who valued this property as entitled for redevelopment with residences as well as a restricted golf course and those related uses. That appraisal concludes that the GC zoning occurs, if the GC zoning occurs on that property, the fair market value of the property will be reduced by $15 million. The report goes on to state that even if the GC zoning were interpreted in such a manner as to allow non-golf course events, such as weddings, conferences, reunions, charity events, that those ancillary uses would only contribute 3% to the gross income of that golf course. A substantial, not, not a substantial amount of money and does not change the value of the golf course. The appraiser states that these types of events are common in private country clubs, supported by members or resort courses, supported by hotel guests, not mid-tier daily fee public access golf courses, such as Villa de Paz. The most difficult thing for me to understand is the potential result of this, if this DC zoning is successful. As we've stated, no one can be forced to run a, pre run a business. So the property will remain an urban brownfield, attracting deterioration and vacancy. The surrounding neighbors will begin losing their property values. The city will be involved in litigation with a potential of paying the property owner $15 million or more. GC will not fix the problem. It will exacerbate it. Finally, on the other hand, while it is my client's intent to seek damage for, damages for the loss of value of their property if GC has passed, in an effort to avoid litigation, they have offered various solutions to the councilwoman for District 5 and the neighbors. The last compromise effort was presented several weeks ago to the councilwoman. That plan was a solution where the owner would set aside 43.7 acres of that which is developable, or 33.5% of the land, in an extraordinary compromise to create an activated public park, whether it be a public park or not with the public, uh, with the parks department working through it, is something that still needs to be decided. The owner would develop the area with improvements such as disc course, uh, a disc golf course, basketball courts, pickleball courts, restrooms, parking, uh, fitness trail, exercise stations, and pres preservation of the existing lakes on the property. They would work with the Parks Department to provide those details. The plan was presented and it was rejected summarily. The owner, however, is open for further discussion on the plan or an alternative to that plan. If you were of the mind, we would request a short continuous to investigate that solution uh, with or without the Parks Department uh, concept. We would hope this matter would be settled without litigation. However, if this cannot be achieved, my client will seek damages for the loss of property rights and diminution of fair market value. 
We urge you to either vote against the risk request for re to rezone my client's property over their objection to GC or a short continuance to try to resolve this matter without having to go to litigation. Thank you very much. Thank you. We will next go to Jeff O'Toole, who may share his 10 minutes for presentation time with others if he chooses. After that, we will go to two minute public comments. Thank you, Mayor, Vice Mayor, members of council. My name is Jeff O'Toole. I live at 4645 North 101st Avenue in Phoenix, right in the center of the Via De Paz golf course. I really appreciate your time this afternoon and the ability to talk to you on behalf of the community about the golf course. I just wanna hit a couple of things first around the history piece. Um, you know, this golf course has been in place since 1972. There was a golf course here before there was much housing around it. There was golf course here before the city of Phoenix was here. Uh, this golf course is a staple of this community and is probably the oldest golf course in, you know, in the west side of town. This community in the 70s was built around a master plan. Um, I have a copy of the master plan in my hand. I think it's been in, uh, in council packets. But the master plan specifically states, and I'll just read, the residents of Vita Paz will live on and around an 18-hole golf course. This community was designed as a golf course community. It's always been a golf course community. That's what it is. And so when the city of Phoenix went to annex this land in the 90s, one of the things that was really important to the residents at that time was that protections were put on the golf course so that it would remain a golf course in perpetuity. For whatever reason, the annexation of that land was done in three different parts. And we've still not really been able to figure out why it was done that way, but for whatever reason it was. And as Mr. Stevenson noted, two thirds of this golf course today, annexation 174, absolutely has a stipulation that requires adherence to the master plan. And the master plan clearly states it's a golf course community and residents will live on around an 18 golf course. So the, the history here is clear. So as we move into the discussion around development rights, I think it's really especially important to point out that at the time virtual partners bought this golf course, it was a fully functioning golf course. I literally golfed it a few weeks before the sale closed and a few weeks after. And when they made that purchase, they could not build a single house on a single hole of this course. Let me repeat that again. When they purchased this property, they could not build a single house on a single hole of this 18 hole golf course. So this idea that they have these development rights that the government's coming in and stripping from them, well, hey those development rights didn't exist in the 70s. It didn't exist in the 80s and the 90s and the 2000s. Uh, there was you know, no development rights for the, for the entire history of this course. What they have been able to do is, in our opinion, exploit a little bit of a loophole in the way that the zoning is written that says if property is abandoned, special permits will be dropped off. And so when virtual partners bought this golf course, they intentionally abandoned it for the sole purpose of utilizing that loophole to build housing. Now, I'm not on the city of uh, Phoenix planning committee, oh but I God. imagine when those stipulations were put in place, the idea was to use that to do infill and to protect vacant properties and to try to drive development in those areas. It was certainly not to intentionally hey abandon a viable asset within the community. Sure. Just for no the problem. sole I'm purpose. I'm on a conference call too. <laughs> for the sole purpose of being able to go in and make the development. And again, even um, by Mr. Lazarus's own admission, you know, there is a stipulation on that piece of property, uh, Annexation 174, which represents two thirds of the golf course. And we know that uh, virtual partners can't build housing on this entire course and that valuation of $15 million if they build housing on all of it, we know that's not viable. Um, speaking about lawsuits, uh, they tried to file a lawsuit to get that stipulation thrown out and that was thrown out of court. So you don't on one hand go to sue to remove a stipulation if the stipulation is already null and void. So we know that stipulation is in place. We know two thirds of the golf course today at this very moment cannot be developed for residential housing. And so this overlay essentially cleans up the kind of weird process of doing this via special permits on those two smaller portions of land. What we're asking for specifically is for the city to have one uniform rule and zoning for this entire parcel uh, and to have it be you know, golf course use as mandated by those stipulations and by the master plan that's been in place since the 70s. It's also really important to note, Mr. Lazarus talks about the brownfield. Uh, you guys may have pictures of the current state of the golf course in your packet, but again, this was a fully functioning, beautiful golf course when they bought it, they abandoned it. Our community went through an entire year of six different cases 
Six different cases, not examples of blight violations, separate cases, because this property owner, uh, we believe, intentionally tried to make this look as bad as possible to strong arm the community development. They wouldn't cut the weeds. They had broken glass in the clubhouse. They you know, wouldn't do any maintenance whatsoever. And rather than paying somebody to come out and mow the grass and do the weeds, they decided to pay lawyers to go to court to continue and continue those cases. So I, I raise that just so that the, the, the you know, uh, the, the city council really can appreciate what our community has been through since this group took over. I sit on the Maryville Village Planning Committee, and we talk a lot on that committee about revitalizing Maryville. It's a, it's a huge tagline. We've put a lot of money into, uh, you know, general plan and uh, use plans and, you know, really trying to understand what the community wants. And the one thing that comes back unanimously is people want to protect the assets in their community. They want to protect that open space. And you know, they wanna revitalize areas that have been run down. Well, I would submit to you council members, the best way to revitalize Maryville is not to devitalize it in the first place. We heard a lot of these same arguments. Some of you on this council were around for the days when Danny Valenzuela was our representative. And a different you know, potential buyer at that time came in saying all these same things. It's not profitable, not possible to run a golf course, gonna be a brownfield, all these things. We were able to stop that in 2013 into 2014. That golf course ran in 2015, 2016, 2017, until this group bought it. So the idea that you can't make a viable golf course there, I think we would all agree, some businesses fail and some businesses succeed. You see all the time uh, a business shut down on a corner and another company come in and do a similar business and be successful. Nobody's asking anybody to run this business at a loss. Nobody's asking for that. What the community is asking for is that we protect the rules that are in place and have been in place on this property since the 70s. And the hope, yes, certainly is that somebody would come in and buy it and want to run it as a golf course. And if you look at the history of uh, golf course in the city of Phoenix, you know, there's been a lot of appetite to do that. We we have revitalized shut down golf courses in the city. There was an article in the West Valley View just two weeks ago about that. And one of the things that was interesting to note, they had four different potential buyers interested in doing that. So there's a lot of appetite here. We have a world-class NFL stadium right across the street from this, from this community. We have an NHL hockey stadium. We have a brand new Top Golf that Glendale just built a couple of years ago. There's this Dodgers and Sox spring training facilities. Uh, they're getting ready to build in Glendale a world-class water park uh, that only exists in a couple of cities across the world. So the idea that nobody wants to invest in this area and that a golf course could not be viable here with this being an entertainment district with that type of investment, uh, we just don't believe that to be the case. So, you know, we really want to protect this asset that's in this community and uphold and protect the restrictions and requirements that have been on this for, you know, since its inception back in the 70s. And the last thing that I guess I'll, I'll point out, I, I'm very encouraged to see that, you know, several members of this, uh, of this council um, are pretty familiar with this issue. Um, uh, Mayor Gallego, we were really, really pleased to see you come out to Via de Paz when, uh, when uh, Councilwoman Gallego, or sorry, um, Guardado first started uh, being a representative for our district to come out to see our community, see the golf course, hear from us firsthand. It was really, really encouraging just that you took that extra step to really understand the importance of this golf course to the community. And I know back when you were a council member in District 8, you were a pretty strong advocate for protecting the Ravenhill golf course. So I know you know some of this firsthand from your district. Um, I've seen Councilman DeCicio fight with his constituents to help save Ahwatukee. And I get that it's a different scenario, but you know, I appreciate the members of this council appreciate how important these types of assets are to their communities. And even Councilman Nowakowski, you were actually at the very first Maryville committee where we presented and ultimately beat you know, the attempt to take over and, and develop the golf course last time. So a lot of members of this, uh, of this council have heard directly from the community and I think appreciate how important and valuable this asset is. Again, we're just asking you to uphold those requirements that have been in place for a super long time. And uh, again, just appreciate the time to share the position of the community and um, look forward to hearing what other members of my community have to say in the public comment section about, you know, why the golf course is important to them and why they bought here. But this is a golf course community. This is our primary asset. You know, this is the reason people move to Via de Paz. This is the thing that we have here that is different and unique. And Again, I, I've read a lot through the general plan and land use and all the different things we're, we're doing as we engage the community. That's what people want. They want protection of those things. So please help us in protecting this on behalf of the community. And I'll yield back the additional of my, uh, of my time. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. We will have a two minute public comments beginning with Albert Nava followed by Don Ray. Mayor, it appear, appears that we are not getting audio from Albert. Wonderful. Uh, perhaps we can come back to him after we have a, a few more. Why don't we then begin, start with Don and go to Bob McNichols following Don. Don Ray, I'm owner operator of Augusta Ranch Golf Club at 2401 South Lansing in Mesa. And I guess I want to tell you that, you know, someone who owns a golf course who's been on the national board for the PGA of, PGA of America, I'm currently on the national board for the National Golf Course Owners Association. I know the power of golf, but I also know that when only 8% of the population plays golf, it's important to make it a community place. It's important to make it a family place. That is how you make a golf course successful. And that is what we do at Augusta Ranch. The model of golf is not dead. It's only dead if you focus only on golf. You need to focus on families. You need to focus on fitness. You need to focus on the mental well, the mental health of, of the people who play, the, the veterans that come out. And I think that could actually absolutely be successful anywhere in our valley. It's just critical that we don't focus just on the 18 holes of golf, but the 90 acres in which a golf course sits, that that is a place to bring communities together. That's a place to do family nights and movie nights and cornhole tournaments and, and bike rides on the golf course. And that's what I know to be true. A golf course can absolutely be successful and an integral part of a community if you focus on the community and not just on the 18 holes of golf. And I know that model works because we've made it work here at Augusta Ranch for many years. Thank you. Thank you. Mayor. Next will be Bob. Oh, uh, I'm sorry, Vice Mayor, go ahead. Yes, I, ju I just have a question for him. Are you, is he still on the line? Yep, I'm here. Okay, perfect. Well, thank you so much for your testimony. I just had a quick question for you. Can, given everything that you just said and, and the way um, that you frame things right now, can you please give us your professional assessment as to the va validity of these claims? Like, you know, like how, how much revenue, uh, do you think it's only 4% or 3% of revenue that you get out of, out of, the other stuff that's not just golfing? No, I absolutely disagree. Our restaurant last year did over $800,000 and we're not on a street. We're inside the community. So, you know, it's not a great location, but people came because they wanted to support the restaurant. Our green fees were about 1.2 million. Um, so there you go. The percentages that have been presented are, are out of whack with what I'm seeing and I've been doing it for 20 years. Great. And my second question is, what is your professional opinion of the potential revenue streams for these non-golf uses? Well, you know, I think uh, it, it goes to what are you going to do? Are you going to try to entertain 100% of the people or just 8%? We have HOA events here at the golf course that have well over 1,000 people, and we have rock climbing walls and bounce houses and things like that. Those are the revenue items that can push your food and beverage revenue well up to a million dollars. I fully see an acceptable golf course pulling in probably a little bit more in green fees. I'm not going to argue about that. Uh, but it's certainly um, a, a lot of food and beverage because that's how you convert people into golfers. You can't just focus on golfers. You focus on people and you convert them to golfers. So you have events that the community comes and, and all of a sudden they see the grass and they smell the grass and they want to be around it more. And so that's the key. Those percentages can easily be 50% of the total. So once again, Augusta Ranch is pulling in, let's just call it, you know, $2.1 million a year. 1.3 is in green fees and 800,000 is in food and beverage. And I'm not even talking about the other little things that we do that, you know, that are kind of incorporated into food and beverage. But, you know, there's all kinds of things you can do at a golf course. It's just a matter of are you going to be creative or stick in the old paradigms? Great. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Vice Mayor. We will go to Bob next, followed by Ed Gowan. And that's Bob Hello? McNichols. Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, good. Uh, my name is Bob McNichols. I'm general manager of Longbow Golf Club and also in Mesa. Um, I, I'm, I'm very interested in the questions 
uh, coming from council members uh, about uh, can uh, you make a profit by serving the community? Um, our golf course uh, does a lot of things that don't make money. We have track meets for high school uh, athletic teams. We have fun runs for 5K and 10K uh, organizations. We have the first T education and instruction programs. Uh, we have public and private school athletic banquets and awards. None of those things make money for us, but they all generate goodwill and public relations benefits for our reputation in the community. If we were able to make money at everything we did, we would do uh, a lot more today, especially if the, the city council in our community uh, required that we make money at everything. It's, it, we're serving the community. There are various types of golf courses. Uh, there are private clubs, there are residential courses. Uh, one uh, person mentioned resort courses uh, and then uh, compared them to daily fee and municipal courses. These are all necessary uh, golf uh, properties to serve different levels of the community, but they all do the same thing. They all serve their constituents and their members, uh, and they don't make money at everything they do. It's not a requirement to be in business that you make money for everything you do. We're an activity center. We're surrounded by residential uh, neighborhoods uh, that want our business to be successful and stay open. Uh, we are open to the public, food and beverage and sporting activities. Uh, we host service organizations, churches, political organizations, and we host adaptive sports for athletes with disabilities. So all of these things are parts of our service to the community and golf is not the only thing we do. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I understand that uh, Mr. Gowan is no longer on the line. Uh, so why don't we go to Doug Fredrickson and then we will perhaps try Albert Nava again to see if we have audio. Hello, can you hear me? We can. Uh, this is Doug Fredrickson, 727 East Bethany Home, Phoenix, Arizona. I'm the president of Douglas Fredrickson Architects, an architectural firm that specializes in golf clubhouse design. In the last 40 years, we've designed 75 clubhouses nationally and internationally. And our local portfolio includes Whisper Rock, Greyhawk, Weekapaw, Troon, Arizona Country Club, and Agueda and uh, Papago for the city of Phoenix. Now the golf course industry has been ever evolving over the last 40 years. And in 2006, probably no industry was hit harder than golf, resulting in loss of <clears throat> courses and revenue, uh, number of rounds being played. In response to that, several of the clubs reached out to my firm and others to start reimagining what the golf clubhouse is and adding amenities such as destination restaurants and event spaces to create new income streams to make up for the loss in revenue from strictly the number of golf rounds being played. It was obvious that to avoid closure and to be a survivor, other opportunities had to be provided to avoid a state of disrepair and dissolve. The new reprogramming and rebranding of the golf club is not only the center of golf operations, but an energetic and entertaining and socializing event venue has proven to be a remarkable success during these last couple of years. We look at them as more of community centers where you can accommodate beyond the normal golf activities of daily play and tournaments and dine, meet with friends, attend weddings, enjoy live music, watch sporting events, and <clears throat> basically have the children have a nice place to play in the exterior. In conclusion, I wanted to point out a couple of examples. In 2015, the city of Phoenix and Grand Canyon University took over the city's Maribel course jointly to build a new clubhouse with a new destination restaurant and an event area to create additional revenue stream beyond golf. In 2018, my firm, along with the city, ASU, and Arizona Golf Foundation, built a new clubhouse in Papago with the destination restaurant and event centers. Both courses went from significantly financially challenged to making money for the first time over a decade. To me, the clubhouse is what makes it all work. Thank you. Thank you. Why don't we try Mr. Nava again to see if we have better sound and then we would try Adrian Betts.
Mr. Nava, you are unmuted. Can we hear you? Mayor, it appears that we cannot hear him yet. All right. Um, shall we try then, at Adrian Betts? Uh, hi, sorry, I, um, I relinquish my, my final message. And I'm sorry, this is Adrian? Yeah, sorry, this is Adrian Betts at uh, 17470 North Pace Center Way in Scottsdale, Arizona. Okay, and I'm sorry, you did not wish to speak. Is that what you said? Oh, that's all right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, then we will go to John Cabrera, followed by Daniel Johnson. Hello, can you hear me? We can. Hi. So uh, my name is John Cabrera. I live at 4601 North 102nd Avenue. Uh, I'm in the condo uh, condos. Uh, our condo number is 1030 Phoenix, Arizona 85037. I'm part of uh, Discovery at Via de Paz. Uh, our condo is right next to the golf course. Uh, my wife, uh, hello, um, sorry, Honorable Mayor Gallego, Vice Mayor Guardado, and City Council members, thank you for having me. My wife and I purchased the condo approximately two years ago. Uh, because we enjoy what well, we enjoyed at the time, the nice golf course. And, you know, I just started to get in golf, in golfing. But uh, unfortunately, since this uh, uh, company, uh, corporation purchased this land, we've seen the uh, tragic deterioration and uh, starving of the uh, uh, green uh, living life, as well as turtles, ducks, et cetera. Um, I'm, I'm a proud member of Save Via de Paz. Uh, there's approximately over uh, 600 uh, community uh, members that uh, support the overlay uh, and leaving the golf course as it is. Um, it's tragic that the uh, person who purchased this uh, golf course, uh, you know, it, it, it appears to me that it's clear that, that they just purchased it to make a dollar. And, you know, everybody, I think, 99% of us who live by the golf course or in the community want it to remain a golf course. And I, um, you know, I really hope the city does protect this golf course and the green space it provides. Um, it would be tragic for, for more houses when there's houses being built all around us at this time. I thank you all for your time and we hope you support it. Thank you. Daniel will be followed by Jeremy Hall. Daniel Johnson. Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Well, thank you very much for having me and for your time. I've lived in Villa Deposit 10125 West Sales Drive uh, for almost 25 years. One of the main reasons we bought this home was in fact the golf course and the joy that we experienced as a result of having that golf course. The previous owners have proven to be, always proved to be good neighbors, just uh, not only for Villa de Paz, but for the city of Phoenix. Current owners have done just the opposite. They've allowed through their abandonment, their intentional abandonment, near blight conditions, ponds have gone dry, Trees have died, trash has accumulated, dead trees fall, and they later rot. Only after many complaints filed with the city, county, and numerous other organizations do they even attempt to come out and clean up or do anything. They've proven to be horrible neighbors. I have no reason to believe that they intend to be good neighbors. They just have to make a dollar. And that's my opinion from what I've seen. Case in point, they allowed the ponds to dry up. There was one pond that had so little water left. There was a picture taken of approximately, I believe it was two to 300 fish dying. Turtles, birds, almost gone. 
and only after being reported again because of those dead fish did they finally get those uh, those ponds refilled after they replaced the pump. They do nothing to maintain. If you see any patches of green anywhere on the golf course, I would submit to the council that it's a result of a broken water pipe. Previous owners were quick to replace those and repair any water leaks. I've seen nothing these people have done other than abandon us and the city of Phoenix. Thank you. Please vote in favor of the overlay. Jeremy Hall is next, followed by Celeste Castorena. Hello, this is Jeremy Hall. I, I live at 4515 East Palo Verde Drive in Phoenix. I have Albert Nava here with me who's got audio problems and I'd like to uh, defer to him. Albert? Yes, can you hear me now? We can finally hear you. Welcome. Oh, I apologize for all the problems. I can see the uh, council meeting, but I can't get any audio, so I apologize. Anyway, uh, yes, uh, I'm an appraiser here in town. Uh, I'm with the uh, president of the Brecken Nava Group. Uh, we're based in Tempe. And uh, I'm, uh, excuse me, I'm a golf course appraiser, uh, among other uh, property types that I do work on. But uh, just as a general background, I'm an MAI appraiser, appraiser and I'm a STA a member of the Society of Golf Appraisers. Uh, I've valued probably, as a company, we've probably valued maybe 1,000 golf courses over the years, 20 to 25 different states, uh, all different kinds of properties, anywhere from resort properties to mid-tier to low, uh, lower quality golf courses. Uh, just as a point of reference, I've done uh, an appraisal of via deposit in the past. We appraised it 2010, 2011, 2013, and we did some additional consultation work uh, for tax consultation in 2017 and 2019. Uh, I believe, uh, if I'm not mistaken, that you all have a copy of the report that was done for Virtue Partners uh, earlier this year, well, just a couple of months ago in August. And I won't go through that because I don't want to bore you with the details. But uh, just to, it's suffice to say that uh, I did uh, do some additional work. We were asked to provide uh, values of the property both as a residential real estate development and as an operating golf course. Uh, specifically, though, I was asked to appear here before council to address uh, any potential for ancillary income at the golf course, and that is uh, why I'm here at this time. Um, it's been brought to my attention, or at least I understand that there's been some uh, uh, comments about uh, using a golf course for other venues, such as uh, 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 maybe wedding events for wedding events. Uh, Keep going, Albert. Uh, wedding events, uh, uh, those kinds of things. But my thought is, and this is really my professional opinion, we only have a property here that has 3,900 square feet. Yeah, the demographics don't necessarily support anything like this. Uh, there, had, there would probably have to be a substantial amount of money invested for something like this. Now you have a venue where uh, you have parties and, meeting and uh, meetings and uh, those kinds of things going on, uh, backing up the neighbors, whether they're apartments, uh, uh, some of the uh, single family homes in the area, I don't know that that would be such a good use of, uh, in fact, I don't believe that would be a good use of that kind of venue. Um, this is not a resort. It's not, uh, you would need uh, probably a hotel or some kind of membership to drive something like this. There are no members, uh, uh, to, my, uh, to my recollection, there were no members other than maybe uh, casual members to the golf course. And it was Could give us your final thought. Thank you. Uh, my final thought is that I don't see any reason or any any real economic reason to be uh, uh, list to go back to being a golf course. There's no there's no bottom uh, positive number that would uh, justify running this thing as a golf course. Thank you so much for your testimony and your patience Thank with our our system, Count, uh, Vice Mayor. Yes, um, Mr. Nava, in your appraisal. Uh, report on page 23, 
You state for appraisal purposes, we have fully assumed that there are no additional easements restrictions which negatively affect the property and we reserve the right to adjust our analysis and valuation accordingly should future studies indicate otherwise. My question is, were you ever informed by your client that over half of the Via de Paz golf course has underlining land use stipulations that protect golf course use that includes all the course that lies within annexation 174? Well, it's my understanding that uh, all permits uh, that uh, uh, were in effect uh, previously are no longer in effect, have not been in effect uh, for a year or more. So that was not uh, really a consideration in my valuation. So basing this on the whole golf course, I mean, I have some documents here that I can give to you um, so you can see um, that not the whole golf course is stipulated, is stipulated um, to be able to build built on. So if you want, I can have my office forward this to you um, so that we can get like a real accurate appraisal. Hey, Thank you're you. more than welcome to me. Yeah. I'm, more than to, I'm more than welcome to consider anything that you have. I don't believe that'll make any, any uh, difference in uh, my valuation. Okay, well, I'll give I'll give this to you just because I I think it it'd be good to re, um for your for your consideration. But but thank thank you so much for answering that. Thank you, Mayor. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Celeste is next, followed by Twyla. Okay. Uh, I am still on. I'm. Here we go. Um. We can hear you. Microphone. You can hear me. Yes, we can. Oh, wonderful. It shows me as being muted still. Okay. My name is Celeste Castorena. I live at, and I have lived at 10122 West Roma Avenue since 2003 when my husband and I bought our home, which overlooks the 10th fairway. And I want to state em um, emphatically community over the personal greed of the property owner who could have collaborated with us to maintain a profitable golf course and clubhouse. And this community is committed to working with a property owner that will work within the master plan that was established in the 1970s and remains viable today, which is to maintain an 18 hole golf course with ancillary activities. Our family urges the city council to vote yes on this overlay in order to rectify a previous error that the golf course owner took advantage of to the detriment of the surrounding neighbors. Please think of the statement of uh, people such as Doug Fred Fredrickson, designer of golf course clubhouses, Bob McNichols, general manager of, um, of a longbow golf club in, in Mesa and the, um, and the golf course owner of Augusta Ranch Golf Course. Uh, People such as them have stated that while uh, profitability is one area of focus, the main focus is on community. And I appreciate your vote for yes on the overlay, keeping in mind community first. Thank you. Thank you. Twyla will be next followed by Gail Bliss. Mayor, we do not see Twyla. We do see a David Grantham, and we're unsure if that would be the correct person as well. I am not sure, but why don't we try Mr. Grantham? I apologize. We are unable to uh, reach Mr. Grantham as well. 
Excellent. Um, we just want always like to remind people that when you register for public comment, you need to sign in using the same name. Someone who did that is Gail Bliss. Gail, you are unmuted. Hello, I'm Gail Bliss and I live at 10052 West Campbell Avenue. I support the passage of the golf course overlay. I remember in the early 70s when the Villa de Paz community started as a golf course community with the first homes at the southwest corner of Indian School and 107th Avenue. I was quite interested in the idea of having a golf course interwoven throughout the community. Finally, in 1982, when I got a job near Villa de Paz, I made my move. I have lived here for 38 years. I selected my lot to be on the golf course. I bought here because I love the open spaces. They provide a feeling of peace and tranquility and also keep the area a little cooler. I also bought because of the wildlife and the bird life. I do not want to lose the open spaces and the enjoyment of seeing the wildlife and the quiet. It is my concern that if the golf course is allowed to be developed, especially the way the developer has in mind, not only will we lose the golf course, but there will be a huge increase in density and traffic will become more congested. It will become noisier and warmer. It will no longer be a place where I would want to live or call home. Please vote to approve the zoning change for the golf course so that Villa de Paz community can continue to exist as it has in the past. A peaceful community with a golf course running through it. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Marsha is our next speaker. Okay. Can you hear me? We can. All righty. This is Marsha von Oscherschleben. I live at 4327 North 106th Avenue on the third fairway. My parents uh, bought the house next to me actually 40 years ago, and we've had our home, my husband and I, for 15 years. As many other people have said, my parents and then us as well bought because we're a golfing family and we have so many. This was so thriving over the years. It was just these last people that I believe came with the intention to uh, do what they did, close it down and, and want to build homes on it. And so I'm so sad. The last time that we... Um, Oh, I'm going to back up. My husband and I are also developers, and we have been on the development side of many of these meetings that we're having right now. And I have to say that the input from the community was so important to us because we personally did not want to get involved in a project that was not a win-win. We just didn't see that was where we wanted to go or that it was going to be good for anybody. So I really feel that this public input is huge on all this, um, <clears throat> like the other lady said, it's just gonna create terrible density. I think the Phoenix General Plan, didn't they say that um, your mission statement and everything was that you wanted to keep, preserve open space and the integrity of these older established neighborhoods and by letting development in here, you're going just the opposite of what you said the, the mission statement for uh, the city of Phoenix is. This is the first and oldest, like they said, um, golf course around. Last time we got the Audubon Society, they came in here, I was on the committee. Um, they uh, photographed burrowing all nests, which are protected and very rare. and it's not it's quality of life for the people and the animals and if you just look within a five mile radius of all the housing development that's going on here it's going to blow your mind we don't need more housing developments please vote to restore this to golf course zoning thank you so much thank you we will next go to ed gowan and then if uh, jeremy hall would like his two minutes he's also separately registered ed yeah, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, very good, finally. Uh, I am the executive director of the Arizona Golf Association, 7600 East Redfield Road in Scottsdale. 
in my background in my 50 years in golf that I have served two terms with the National Golf Foundation, which accumulates data on and behalf of golf courses in the golf industry. I can, after listening to the appraiser's comments, uh, my only judgment there would be that that's probably a valid comment based on the current status of the property. But as Mr. Ray and Mr. McNichols have noted, golf courses, especially community golf courses, are more than viable in today's economy, in spite of anything else you might hear, if they are community projects. Uh, investment may be necessary to upgrade the property to a point where it can be successful, but there is no question at all that golf at that location can be successful. The other item I'd like to point out is in all the data gathering we did with the National Golf Foundation, to say that three or 4% of the ancillary monies come from food and beverage and those activities can only be <clears throat> a comment the appraiser made based on that current facility and its current condition. As Mr. Ray noted and Mr. McNichols can tell you from his operations, most golf courses will do between 25 and 50 percent of their gross revenue from the ancillary activities in addition to green fees. If a course is going to su survive on green fees alone, it must be one of the best courses in the country of the 16,000. Otherwise, it just can't survive without being a community partner and a vibrant part of that community. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you. Mr. Hall, would you like final words? Thank you. I would like Mr. Lazarus to, uh, to, to take this time and just have a couple minutes, please, if you would unmute him. Um, no, thank you. Uh, Mr. Lazarus did get his full time. Um, so if you have any comments, you are registered separately. No, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, for our city staff, I think we have everyone who registered. Did I miss anyone? Mayor, that was all of them. All right. Um, council member comments or questions, and we, we can certainly, if anyone has council member questions for anyone who testified, we can see if they are still with us. Vice Mayor. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much, Mayor, and thank you for this opportunity. And just piggybacking a little bit what Mr. O'Toole was saying earlier, I remember when I first took office a little bit over a year ago, one of the first things that we did was, and I'm very appreciative of you, Mayor, coming with me on this tour. We took a tour of the whole district and we looked at the different areas and our final stop was at Villa de Paz. Our constituents had some of the same concerns we hear about throughout the whole city. Safe streets, safe neighborhoods, paved streets, improved city services. I think our city staff has done a tremendous job in, in our accelerated pavement program. I think everyone on the city council has done a great job in terms of keeping, keeping our, our city safe. Um, and one of the areas that we talked a lot about in that tour was about the golf course and this community golf course and the passion that constituents have around this golf course. Now, Mr. Lazarus, I know you did not represent the owner virtual partners at the time, but my office made many attempts. Um, it was one of the first phone calls that we made when I first took office because one of the commitments I had made um, to my constituents um, and to everyone else was that we were going to find a resolution, a middle ground where we could all sit down and have a conversation. And we heard nothing from, from the owner. Um, we did many attempts. My staff did many attempts. And we never and we never heard, heard back from them. However, it fell on deaf ears. The clients, your client, Mr. Lazarus, never got back to us. And the, and the client decided to close down, to close down the, the golf course, which is something that the community was very upset about. In front of me, I have photos of dead fish in ponds, unattained open space, and a boarded up pro shop that your client himself described it as a crack house, which is something that they created when they decided to shut down this golf course. And that is something that I was very struck by. I was out in Villa de Paz this weekend 
I'm talking to neighbors and, and, and the feeling was not the same. We always talk about how is it that we want people to stay in their neighborhoods, become active, engage in their neighborhoods, and Villa de Paz is no longer that. Um, we no longer we no longer have that same sentiment um, that used to be there before, and that's very heartbreaking given all the work that everyone is trying to do to keep the city safe and keeping our constituents happy. Your client bought this property as a functional golf course, Mr. Lazarus, and purposely neglected it in its attempt to show it was not a viable use of the land and then was a, had the nerve to make such comments on the condition that it's in. Imagine my constituents that have to actually watch this happen, watching the trees die, watching the green space go to blight. Um, I know that we we have NSD that has also filed a claim on this because this golf course is not being kept up because they're trying to eliminate all the different um, permits to be able to build on this. I don't think it's right. I don't think it's fair what we're doing to this community just because we want to build housing on it. Um, I was talking to some children and they talk about how there's dead fish in the ponds and how it stinks over the summer. Over 100 residents of the Villa de Paz has taken the time to write letters in support of this item today. I would like to read a few of my constituents' words in the for the record so you can hear from them the impact that virtual partners disregard the community. So letter number one is from Romel, I'm sorry, Kovaki. And one of the comments, I won't read the whole thing, but one of them says, it took me over 30 years to be able to buy a home in this neighborhood. I dreamed of living after growing up in Maryville cluster area and living near the Desert West Park with its tiny duck pond. Please don't let them take from us what, what took me over half of my lifetime to be able to achieve. Um, the next one is from Tricia White. I am an elementary school music teacher who purchased a home in this neighborhood over eight years ago. In addition to being an affordable area for public school teachers to still buy a home, I have always felt fortunate to live right on a beautiful golf course. Two years ago, developers came in and bought the course, shut it down, neglected it, and hoped we would all go away and we would, and that we would ne never be able to put up a fight. This is, this is me fighting. Please put families and individuals in front of those that only seek to profit. As an elected representative of this district, I am disgusted by the way the community has been treated throughout this process. I was always hopeful, however, that we wouldn't get to this point. Mr. Lazarus, I appreciate your efforts since being hired as legal representative, but I struggle between the threats of litigation to find a well-rounded land use argument. Your client virtual partners bought a golf course surrounded by a master plan golf course community. And I think of a better use of this designation. The master plan documented date May 1973 clearly states the residents of Villa de Paz will live on and around an 18 hole golf course. Today, we are seeking to reaffirm this original intent and right zone the Villa de Paz golf course. However, since you are making the argument as to the financial viability of operating a course, I would like to add that it's my belief that having this destination would help to increase the value of the land with the ability to open up new revenue streams. In addition to a golf course, they would have the ability for special events such as weddings, quinceañeras, corporate events, and other similar uses. It is my hope moving forward from today that we can get to a place where our offices can work with your client from a place of equity, fairness, community benefit. Again, the hundreds of homeowners that have shown up through this process have shown they are ready to fight for their community and as a council, it is my hope that we will stand with them. And yes, there was a comment made about me listening to my constituents. Yes, I will always listen to my constituents. I will also listen to the developers and we'll try to find a place. We're, we'll always try to find that happy medium. With that, I would like to make a motion, Mayor, to approve the golf course over the evening. Before planning. you do that, okay. I need to close the public hearing. Okay, that's fine. <laughs>
All right. I have now closed the public hearing on item 81. Okay. Now, so I would like to make a motion to approve item 81, the golf course overlay zoning per the planning commission recommendation as it relates to the land use change and adopt the related ordinance. Second. Thank you. We have a motion and a second. Uh, council member questions or comments, statements? Uh, Mayor, just one comment. Councilwoman Stark. Mm -hmm. I, I appreciate all the comments from these golf course owners. Um, hopefully they'll take a look at this property. Um, however, um, you know, we still need to be cos cognizant of what a golf course overlay gives us in the city of Phoenix. So some of their comparisons in, in Mesa, Mesa may not necessarily concur with what we have in our uh, zoning district in the city of Phoenix, but I do appreciate their, their comments. Thank you. And hopefully they'll work with us. Thank you. Thank you. A good comment. And, and of course, important to note that that we are not the zoning administrators or do, nor do we interpret at this body what a zoning curve district means. Right. Uh, council member comments. Roll call. Cecio? No. Garcia? Yes. Nowakowski? Yes. Pastor? Yes. Stark? Yes. Waring? No. Williams? I have real reservations about this. I'm hoping they will continue to talk to the councilwoman. It's something healthy and prosperous there. No. I'm sorry, Councilwoman Williams, was that a no? Okay, yes. Yes. Thank you. Guardado? Yes. Gallego? Yes. Passes 6-3. Thank you. We next move to item 82, which is an eight hour rule request to pursue intergovernmental agreements related to affordable housing and homelessness. Uh, Vice Mayor. Mayor, I move that we continue item 82 to the October 27th policy meeting where we will already be discussing the topic of homelessness. And Mayor, I'll second okay. that. Thank you. Homelessness is a, a topic of importance to everyone on this council, which is why our land use committee has, and others have worked so hard on it and why we will be spending so much time on it next week. And Mayor, may I? Councilwoman Stark. Thank you. Um, I actually, uh, I like what they're requesting and the eight hour rule, the, uh, the components. I just think with our discussion on um, Tuesday, we might actually have some additional uh, requests for uh, the eight hour rule. That's why I will support the continuance. Thank you. Mayor. Councilman DeCicio. I will also be supporting the continuance. I really love what uh, Councilman Stark said because if there's more things we can add into this, why not? If we wanna make yep. it more comprehensive, why not? We should be doing that. I don't think anybody's wedded to one idea at all. I think everything should be on the table. And I really do appreciate those comments. Thank you, Mayor. I'll be supporting this. Councilman Nowakowski. Thank you, Mayor. As one of the persons that signed the, um, the letter for an add-on, I think it's really important that we start that dialogue with the state and the county, and we start to use all of our resources to really um, do something with the um, homeless community, and especially our veterans and people with mental illness. So I think that um, continuing it till next Tuesday would be good. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Walt Gray is online. Walt, um, 
we will be taking testimony only on whether you are comfortable with the continuance and not on the substance of the discussion, but we would open up the line for Mr. Gray, who has waited patiently, um, but only take testimony on whether you support a continuance. I, uh, Mrs. Walt Gray, I support the continuance. Wonderful. With that, all those in favor of a continuance, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Passes unanimously. We will have a great discussion next week. That concludes our agendized items and we will move to public comment. I will turn to our city attorney to introduce public comment. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Mayor, members of the council and the public, during citizen comment, members of the public may address the city council for up to three minutes on issues of interest or concern to them. The Arizona Open Meeting Law permits the City Council to listen to the comments, but prohibits council members from discussing or acting on the matters presented. Thank you. Elizabeth Venable will be first, followed by Alicia McKinley. Elizabeth, you are unmuted. Mayor, it appeared that Elizabeth is not audible at this time. Can you hear me? Uh, now can we hear can me? hear you. Yes. Sorry, I was having technical problems with the earbuds. It's an Apple thing. <laughs> um, anyways, what I wanted to say was thank you to a particular member of council who uh, said that they would investigate my complaint regarding unlicensed slum rentals uh, in the vicinity of Cass, including 1010 West Madison, which is zoned for um, which is zoned for wiring repairs and is being occupied by tenants uh, who may be being illegally evicted and visited on the property without any notice, et cetera, et cetera. So thank you to the council member who reached out to various departments. We are also reaching out to various departments. And I just hope you don't let this person who is hopefully well known to you now um, from my email, I hope you don't let this person influence policy. And I think you really need to look into who some of these um, business owners are down by Cass, especially the slum people. So thank you. Oh, I'm done. Thank you, Elizabeth. Is Alicia with you as well? No, she's not. I'm sorry. She couldn't do it today. Okay, thank you very much. We will now turn to our final speaker of the council meeting, Taylor Earl. Thank you, Mayor. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Thank you, uh, Mayor and Council. Uh, my name is Taylor Earl with the law firm of Earl and Curley, 3101 North Central Avenue. Uh, normally, I would be in front of Council presenting a zoning case, uh, but tonight uh, I just wanted to come and say thank you. As you may know, uh, my father, Stephen Earl, recently and suddenly passed away. Uh, my father had been what I would call a mainstay in the zoning world for over 30 years. During that time, he represented, I don't know how many cases in the city of Phoenix. 
as a family at his passing, we were heartbroken, but uh, I would say we were grateful. Grateful for so many years together. Um, I am personally grateful for so many years of being able to practice law together, ultimately becoming law partners. Um, that was one of the great honors of my life. My father was proud, very proud of the work he did in the city of Phoenix. He worked on wonderful projects and had very valuable collaborations in the city. His work to help build the community meant so much to him throughout his life. But I recognize that none of that could have happened without the work of many individuals in the city of Phoenix. So this afternoon, please uh, let me say thank you. Thank you first to the members of the city council, both past and present, for your engagement and leadership on those cases that he worked on and for your respect and friendship with him over the years. Thank you to the members of the planning commission and the many village planning committees, both past and present, for detailed analysis and thoughtful questions and comments and for pushing his projects to be better. And thank you to the many outstanding city employees, city managers, attorneys, directors, planners, and everyone else over the many years who collaborated with him to turn good projects into great projects. Countless hours on meetings, emails, phone calls. Thank you for helping to truly make my father's career more than just a job. To him, it was one of the great life purposes that he had, which was to bring good development to the Valley, including Phoenix, and to do so with integrity, professionalism, and if you knew him well, a little humor. So thank you on behalf of my family, my firm, and myself. I, I want you to all know that we believe your contributions truly matter and that they are deeply appreciated. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you so much for taking the time to share this message with us. Uh, Councilwoman Starker. Councilwoman, I, if you are speaking, I cannot hear you. I apologize. I um, I just wanted to say, I know I can't speak personally to uh, Taylor, but what he said was spot on. Stephen Earl was one of the finest attorneys that I ever worked with. So I really appreciate his comments. Thank you. Mayor. Thank, thank you, Councilwoman. Um, Councilman DeCicio, followed by the Vice Mayor. And quite frankly, uh, you know, I've been around for a while, so it's Zelda um, on the council, probably the longest ones there now. And at all times, Steve was one of the most genuinely kindest men I've ever met. He was the most respected. He was an incredibly good person. And, you know, the times that we sometimes get approached by individuals, there's always a question of doubt of whether or not they're telling you the whole story. Steve, his honor meant everything to him and to Taylor and his family. I cannot tell you how proud he is of all his family and all his children, his grandchildren, the whole thing. I mean, I still am in a state of shock. You know, he was just a, a, the passing of a great individual. And we were blessed as a city, as individuals to get to know him. Um, but I think the blessings that he put on to his own family were even greater than that. And that's something that a lot of us miss out when we talk to the individuals on the other side, when we talk to them, when they're up there presenting, we don't look back past that screen, but Steve always carried that with him, his family, how proud he was. I know I've talked to him several times about his son. I said, you gotta just be so proud of me as I am, I'm so proud of these people, but they've done so much, you know, so, I mean, we were blessed to have an individual like that in our lives. And, you know, I'm, you know it's just, I, I'm still in a state of shock over that. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councilman DeCiso. We will go to the Vice Mayor, and then I understand Walt, Gra Walt Gray is online for public comment. So we will, when council members complete their comments on this. Uh, Thank we'll you, Mayor. Thank you. Yes, um, Mr. Stephen Earl, he was, I mean, I only got to work with him 
for a little bit over a year, but he was always incredibly supportive of, of everything that I was doing in our district last year. He helped us with a water drive that we did in the district and he was incredibly helpful, always there, answer the phone whenever we needed to talk to him and being able to pick his brain about ideas for our district as well. Like I am also um, still in shock um, because um, Taylor and I had just had a conversation about where he was at with his health and how he was doing so much better. I think it was the same day or the, or the day after that. So so definitely we'll always remem remember him for the great person he was and all the contributions that he did for the city and also for District 5. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you so much, Vice Mayor. We will go to the phones for Mr. Gray. And thank you to Mr. Earl for that very important testimony. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, first, I wanna just add my congratulations to Dr. Stark uh, for her work with the homeless population. Um, I hope that maybe the next uh, shelter that's built in Phoenix or in the Valley is named after her. Um, I think that would be fitting of somebody who contributed so much. Um, also, I want to ask the city mayor, if you would direct the city staff to provide me with uh, detailed information or somewhat detailed, I don't expect a long dissertation, but a little detail on the three payments, I think, that were made on October 7th by the city council. Uh, these, these were uh, settlement claims that were uh, approved by the city council. Uh, but I have had a very difficult time finding out why uh, payments were made to these three individuals. Uh, the individuals are Hendricks, H-E-N-D-R-X, Austin, A-U-S-T-I-N, and Lopez, L-O-P-E-Z. Uh, I'd like to know what led to the pay, you know, what... Uh, misdeeds were done by the city, what department, and, um, uh, you know, what, what happened that would justify paying these people money. And also, uh, if any discipline was issued to those uh, employees who <laughs> caused these payments, and whether any changes are, have been made in policies to prevent these kind of uh, misdeeds that uh, lead to payments by the city of Phoenix. <coughs> um, I hope that you have, you have my email as part of my registration to speak. I hope you will uh, use that email and have your staff uh, send me an email. Also, um, I'd like to ask uh, just as an individual and I think uh, it's pretty representative. You know, I've been living in the inner city 44 years, and um, and I I think I have a pretty good feel for the inner city. I've been a community activist the past 18 years, and I think it'd be very good um, uh, to inform the public when you will consider the recommendations of the ad hoc committee on the police department. And uh, if you would, uh, I think it's very important that Chief Williams and one of the spokesmen for plea uh, publicly speak on, on those recommendations. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gray. If staff could provide Mr. Gray a little bit of information about the traffic accidents and items from last October 7th, that would be great. We are adjourned. Let's go.